And so let's take a look um, maybe at what total variation is actually doing. So let's say that we've got this arbitrary function. We've already seen kind of um, many, many times kind of what we're doing. We're choosing x values and we're partitioning our interval. Then that's going to give us points on our curve. From the points on our curve, now we start connecting them with straight lines and we're really looking at how much vertical distance that that curve is actually covering. Now if we kind of think back maybe, well where have we seen this kind of thing happen before? Well we have seen it back in probably multivariable calculus when we were beginning to talk about arc length that we would do the same thing. That with calculus, what do we do? We have a problem that we want to solve, so we approximate the solution, and then we improve the approximation with limits. And that's kind of the motivation a little bit for what we're doing in this case. And so let's take a look at what we really um, maybe review a little bit about um, the arc length of a curve. So kind of refreshing your memory on the formula for actually calculating arc length, we've got some curve, and let's say that curve um, has a, um, we define it parametrically, so we've got x as a function of t and y as a function of t on some closed interval a, b. Then what we did was exactly um, akin to what we were doing with total variation in that we took a partition of the domain t0, t1, and then we, that corresponded to points on the curve, and then we looked at the distance function between those corresponding points. And so in two dimensions we had um, x of t sub k minus x of t k minus 1 quantity squared plus y of t sub k minus y of t sub k minus 1 quantity squared and that, so that just gave us the distance between consecutive points on our curve. Now um, when that went over to three dimensions, kind of the same thing happened. Um, we had now x, y, and z as functions of t. Uh, still our distance formula pretty much remained the same. Um, and even if we go ahead and bump that up into an arbitrary m-dimensional space, then our arc length was still going to be approximated by the sum of the distances um, along the points in this curve that corresponded to our partition. And so what this really gave us then was kind of our approximation. We then approved the approximation with limits. But if we just stop and look at this approximation for just a second, if we rather than let m get really, really big and go to any arbitrary dimension, what happens to our formula if we let m equal 1? And so when we just simply restrict to the case that m is 1, our summation just becomes the sum over one and only one element. Well, we take the square root of something squared, what happens? We just drop the square and we throw in the absolute values. And so now if we replace x sub 1, so our component of our um, function, if we just replace x sub 1 with f, then what we end up with is exactly our delta f sub k's, the absolute value of our delta f sub k's. And sure enough, that is the variation of f with respect to our partition p that we took. And so... Um, what are we really doing with these um, when we're calculating the variation with respect to a parameter? We're cal calculating, we're approximating the arc length for a curve in only one dimension. That's what we're doing when we're measuring total variation. So our total variation, as these things get longer and longer and longer, our total variation is nothing more than the arc length of a curve in one dimension. And so with our total variation that we've been measuring, um, our functions of bounded variation 
um, really then fall in a slightly larger class of something called rectifiable curves. Um, that all that we really mean by a rectifiable curve is that that curve has an arc length to it. Um, a non-rectifiable curve is a curve that does not have an arc length. And so our functions of bounded variation are really just one-dimensional curves that have an arc length to them. Now when we start talking about functions that are not going to be of bounded variation, we very quickly run into a mathematician that you may have seen somewhere, or at least heard his name somewhere. Enter Niels Helge von Koch. Now Koch was a Swedish mathematician he was born in 1870 and died in 1924. Now, one of his theorems um, on number theory um, that he proved in 1901 made the connection between the Riemann hypothesis and a stronger form of the prime number theorem. Now that's one of the things that he's known for, but probably where you've heard more about him is from a curve that actually bears his name and that curve is the Koch snowflake. Now where this curve actually came from um, he describes uh, discovered in 1904 and it's uh, can be seen in a paper entitled on a continuous curve without tangents constructible from elementary geometry. Now what you're seeing in the construction of this particular curve, so if you're not familiar with it, I um, have to give credit to Wikipedia here, so um, that's where this animation is really from, that the idea behind constructing the snowflake is you begin with an equilateral triangle. Now for each side of the equilateral triangle, you're going to split it into three equal sized pieces, and you're going to remove the middle third of it. Now, when you remove that middle third, you're going to insert two sides of another equilateral triangle um, to produce kind of this wedge shape along each straight line edge. And that gives you one iteration. And for every straight line edge, you're going to do that same thing on the next iteration. You're going to split it into thirds, insert the web sh wedge shape, um, next iteration, uh, split it into thirds, remove the middle third, insert the wedge shape, and so on. And so what you're seeing here is an animation of the first seven iterations of what this snowflake is actually going to look like. Um, now this is going to be an example of a non-rectifiable curve. Um, the length of this thing is going to head off to infinity. We'll do that calculation in just a second. And uh, an example of a fractal uh, that we see that's self-similar and kind of you see in this next part whether we're kind of zooming in also from Wikipedia. Um, you're zooming in on a side of it and you see the self-similar nature, the magna, the um, magnification is increasing and so you're kind of just zooming in on one particular portion of it. Particular portion of it. So let's look at how we actually get the length of this um, snowflake. So as we go from one iteration to the next, each straight line segment that we do is actually going to be split into four segments. Now if we let n sub k equal the number of segments at the kth iteration, then we get this recurrence relation where just n sub k is going to be equal to 4 times n sub k minus 1. Now our zeroth iteration, um, we're starting with uh, an equilateral triangle with just three sides. And so our closed form for a number of sides just looks like n sub k is equal to 3 times 4 to the k. Now the length of the line segment actually goes from uh, is actually going to be one-third the length from the previous iteration. And so uh, 
if we start with a unit length um, triangle, then if we let s sub k be the length of a straight segment at the kth iteration, then we start off with s sub 0 just being 1, so a unit length uh, triangle. Then s sub k is going to be one third of s of k minus one, which just gives us one over three to the k as the length at of a straight line segment at the kth lines at the kth iteration. And so, kind of putting this together, the arc length at the kth iteration is just going to be the product of s sub k times n sub k, which leaves us with three times four third to the k power. And of course, as k goes off to infinity, that arc length is going to head off to infinity. And so, this particular curve has um, an unbounded length to it. Now another function that we see is still very fractal-like in form. Really it was probably one of the first fractals that was ever actually studied. Um, is a function that's definitely not of bounded variation and that's going to be the Weierstrass function. Now for the Weierstrass function um, it was originally written in the form of a um, a trigonometric series and so really we have f of x just being the infinite sum of a to the n cosine b n pi b to the n times pi x um, so it was really kind of written as a Fourier series of this thing with the conditions on the coefficients that a was going to be some real number between 0 and 1, b was going to be a positive integer, an odd positive integer, so that a times b was going to be greater than 1 plus 3 halves times pi. Now when Weierstrass introduced this function, um, the big deal about it was that yes this was a continuous function so it's going to be continuous everywhere but it was nowhere differentiable and so it was kind of assumed for a really long time even kind of going back to um, Gauss that if a function um, was going to be continuous then the set of points at which it couldn't be differentiated was going to be finite or countable or something along those lines and that turned out absolutely not to be true as this is, um, here's Weierstrass's example of one of these functions. Now to actually see that yeah it's sure enough not going to be a function of bounded variation um, for one thing we can take a look at the graph um, as we here's a, an example of the graph that we kind of see from Wikipedia again um, it's pretty obvious that this thing is really very fractal-like in nature and its structure. Um, but the proof that it's going to be um, not of bounded variation takes a little bit more machinery than we have necessarily at this point. But here's a short way to see it. And this is actually a theorem from um, Royden's 1988 book, uh, Real Analysis. Um, the reference will be at the end of the video, where if we let f be an increasing real valued function on a closed interval a, b, then f is differentiable almost everywhere. Now what we mean by almost everywhere, um, this is a statement involving measure theory, so sets of almost everywhere means the set of points where it's not differentiable um, has measure zero. Um, and so measure zero is a little bit complicated. Again, here's the machinery that we don't quite have yet, but we'll have um, as we go on through the course. But the idea is basically this, that a function of bounded variation, we've already proven that it's going to be the difference of two increasing functions. Increasing functions are going to be differentiable almost everywhere. Weierstrass showed that his function was not differential, was, um, uh, was nowhere differentiable. And nowhere differentiable in particular means that the size of the set, the measure of the set at which it's um, not differentiable is not of measure zero. And so that means that the Weierstrass function cannot be a function of bounded variation. So um, 
This has kind of been a little bit of a side thing as to, okay, where do these functions of bounded variation kind of fit in and and uh, where am I going to see them? So um, hopefully this has been a little bit enlightening for you. Mm -hmm.